rack up some bonus points and follow the bouncing ball in the history of pinball, featuring footage of rare games and celebrity interviews, next. The following program is brought to you by Priority Mail from the U.S. Postal Service. We are 345.6 miles from El Paso, Texas. Austin is north northeast, turning south southeast. Dry clean or 3.4 miles away. Buenos Aires. I am 45 feet above sea level. 47. Should have bought you a tie. You rely on Amazon.com for electronics and all sorts of gifts. They rely on Priority Mail to get it there fast and to save you money. At this pace, we would get there in 12 days. What's your e-priority? Like Coming up next on AMC's American Pop. Fast flippers and busy bumpers score a free play in the pop documentary, The History of Pinball, right here on AMC's American Pop. What you gotta do is beat the machine. Try to hit selected targets to increase your score. Put the ball through numbered or lettered sequence lanes to advance bonus or to light up selected thumper bumpers. You can beat this game on points by lighting the special or by matching. But remember, you've got to keep the ball in play or, okay, you drained. You've got four more balls left, so let's go. and roll about pinball. There's energy in it, you know, the speed of the ball, the angles, the dramatic way of trying to hit a shot and the excitement about it. I mean, pinball is great. I don't think there's really any other game that compares to it, you know, I'm sorry. When it comes down to it, it's really like, when you're playing guitar solo, you have to try and get from your head to your fingers in the fastest amount of time possible so you can get the point across in time, right? Same thing with pinball. That's right, Slash. When I got the flippers in my hand, it's just like the baseball game. Yeah. It rules the world, it's got total control. That's what I do for a living. And when I'm on this game, this is what I do for a living. The machine knows when there's a serious player around. Yes, flipper control, oh, yes. Flippers control just like the bat. There's something magical about an arcade. The sights, 
the sounds, the atmosphere, and of course, the machines. At places like this, we've all played the game. It is enjoyed by everyone. This pure American form of recreation has fascinated, challenged, and entertained millions around the world. It has inspired movies, Broadway plays, and even hit rock and roll records. Today's pinball designers can take you virtually anywhere you want to go. Back in time to experience an authentic 1950s drive-in, complete with your favorite creature feature, to an awe-inspiring theater of magic, with a spinning magic trunk and levitating balls. To a futuristic carnival where you're taunted by a maniacal talking puppet who wants to keep you out of his funhouse. Or even on a mission into space. Pinball has served as a consistent barometer of our modern day pop culture. It has been influenced by our fashions, our favorite leisure activities, Hollywood, popular television shows, sports, and our music. What used to be simple to manufacture now requires teams of designers, artists, engineers, assemblers, and composers to create a game that continues to capture the imagination of its players. But it wasn't always this way. In the English countryside around the turn of the 17th century, a game called Nine Holes was gaining popularity. Nine Holes was played outdoors, where players would roll six balls into various scoring holes dug into the ground. Soon, the French introduced a cue stick and brought the game indoors. The French called this indoor Nine Holes game Bagatelle. The difference between Bagatelle and its English predecessor Nine Holes was the introduction of wooden pegs located around the various scoring holes at the top of the playing board. By the late 1700s, Bagatelle had become quite popular throughout Europe. But how would this unique game make its way across the Atlantic to America? In a way, pinball really started with the American Revolution. And how do you make a connection like that? Well, the French came over and brought their game of Bagatelle, which was a marble game. Uh, the French were allied with us during the American Revolution. The American officers played with the French officers. They picked up the game, and Bagatelle became the American Army game. Charles Dickens even makes mention of these amusing games in his 1836 novel, The Pickwick Papers. By the mid-1800s, the wooden pegs on the playing field were being replaced by brass pins, which eventually gave birth to the name Pinball. Bagatelle was very popular throughout the United States during the mid-1800s. This political cartoon depicts Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet playing a leisurely game of Bagatelle. Meanwhile, the English had come up with their own unique version of Bagatelle, and it was called Kakamaru. The significance of this English gambling game was the introduction of shooting lanes on the far left and far right sides of the board. Another interesting aspect of Kakamaru was the use of immediate on-site scoring capabilities through the use of these scoring troughs. In America, a game called Tivoli became the Americanized Bagatelle board. The popularity of Tivoli grew fast, and in no time at all, it was popping up in bar rooms and saloons across America. By the 1860s and 70s, as saloons and gambling parlors began to sprout up across the United States, American inventors, manufacturers, and game makers were entering the gaming market at an astounding pace. Meanwhile, with its dual-channel ball introduction lanes, pins, pegs, and scoring troughs, Tivoli would remain popular in the U.S. until the early 1900s. 
One of the single most important patents in pinball's history was issued to Montague Redgrave of Cincinnati, Ohio. His invention, the ball shooter, known today as the plunger. Redgrave has been called the father of American pinball, and this is his game, improvements in bagatelle. Montague Redgrave would never realize the true significance of his invention, for what he had created was the first true pinball machine. Montague Redgrave came here in 1871, took the bagatelle game, and took a brand new technology, the ability to wrap a steel wire into a spring. He put that spring on the end of a shooter, put the shooter on the game, and that's precisely the same shooter we have today in pinball. Redgrave's wonderful new game with its bells and spring-loaded plunger was very popular indeed. Redgrave's game did very well in the gaming market from the 1880s until the early 1900s. Almost everything in the world of coin-operated games and arcade devices seemed to be coming out of Chicago around the turn of the century. When you're talking about the industrial age, it had to be Chicago because it had tremendous labor pool. In the year 1905, only one out of ten Chicagoans were native-born Americans. And these were people that came from Europe with talents and skills. They'd worked in machine shops. They knew what was going on, and so they helped the city industrialize, and that was the labor pool that led to the coin machine industry. Of the two Kale brothers, Arthur was the natural salesman and promoter. His brother Adolf was the tinkerer. Together they would play a very important role in pinball's history with this game called Log Cabin. This sturdy, well-made game was aggressively marketed throughout the U.S. and was seen on hundreds of saloon counters and barrooms across the country in the early 1900s. Each game was loaded with 250 steel balls. When the coin was dropped into the slot, the handle could be turned to place the ball into the side alley to then be shot onto the playing field. This is believed to be the first photograph ever taken of a pinball machine in the field. It was shot around 1900. The game at the end of the bar is Log Cabin. As you get into pinball history, you're gonna hear about Harry Williams, but there's another Harry that you haven't heard about yet and his name was Harry Reed, and he came from Salem, Massachusetts. What did Harry do? Well, in the early 1900s, he took a folding bagatelle board that he took to carnivals and fairs, electrified it, put light bulbs and a big flat thing in the back and red, white, and blue lights, and as you scored, those lights would flash on and off. That was the beginning of a flashing back glass. Unfortunately, Reed would never realize the true significance of his ingenious accomplishment. In one move, he had introduced electricity and the back glass to pinball. The demands of the First World War curtailed innovations and significant manufacturing efforts in the pinball business. A similar manufacturing halt of pin games would happen again some 30 years later in World War II. But another unexpected blow had also come to pinball in the 1920s, prohibition. With the loss of this nation's 225,000 saloons and barrooms, all of the coin-operated game industry suffered. To make matters worse, the budding motion picture industry was pulling people out of the penny arcades and into the theaters. Despite the initial bad news of the early 1920s, some very important changes were just around the corner for pinball. This game is called Wiffle. It was made by these three gentlemen from Youngstown, Ohio. Art Paulin was a very depressed guy. He was a farmer in Youngstown, Ohio and a carpenter. The depression was on, there was no work, he had a problem. He had a game that he, his daughter had, it was a little bagatelle game, he took it to a local drugstore and showed it to a bunch of his buddies there and they said, you know, if we put a coin mechanism in this thing, we'd make a lot of money. And that led to the pinball game called Wiffle. Soon, Wiffle was a national phenomenon and Automatic Industries Incorporated became the first factory in the world solely dedicated to pinball. Ironically, Pinball's first wave of mass popularity came at a time when you would least expect it. During the depths of the Great Depression, Americans were out of work and out of hope. People needed an escape. And for only a penny, you could play your troubles away. In the late 1920s, a young entrepreneur named David Gottlieb was traveling the American Southwest. 
As a distributor of punch cards and test your grip machines, he realized the opportunities available in the budding coin-operated amusements industry. David Gottlieb was about to make pinball history. In 1931, Gottlieb introduced a machine that would generate a wave of excitement that is still felt to this day. Baffle Ball was the world's first mass-produced and mass-marketed pinball machine. And David Gottlieb was about to become a very wealthy young man. Well, Baffle Ball was offered for sale in 1931 for a cost of $17.50. And you'd get seven balls for one penny, and uh, some distributors purchased the game and put it out. And after one weekend, they realized with more than $17.50 in the cash box, the game has paid for itself in a couple of days. So consequently, the demand became significant for the game, and they built over 60,000 of them. Ray Maloney worked for a small game distribution company called Line Manufacturing. Due to the demand for his game, Gottlieb would turn to Line Manufacturing to serve as one of the many distributors of Baffle Ball. When Ray Maloney took a look at Gottlieb's wonderful machine, he saw a unique opportunity for wealth and fortune. Dick Bouchel explains. One of the really great geniuses in pinball was a marketing guy, and his name was Ray Maloney. And he sold punch boards and things like that. And he was a distributor for games. So he was a distributor for Baffle Ball. But Gottlieb was so behind in orders, he couldn't get delivery. So he said, I'm going to make my own game. So what he did is he took a game, somebody brought it to him, he took the cover of a magazine called Ballyhoo, which had a big harlequin design, put the design on the game, put the name on the game, took the thing to the show, built a big booth, and you've got to remember now that most of the people that were in the business were veterans of World War I. So he took the tune of Mademoiselle from Armentiers and said, what'll they play in 32, Ballyhoo? What'll they play in 32, Ballyhoo? He named his company after it. Valley. Forty years later, his company name would be mentioned on a hit rock and roll song by The Who from the rock opera Tommy. Soon, Bally was surpassing Gottlieb with over one million dollars in annual sales. Pinball was spreading like wildfire across the country. In 1933 alone, there were well over 75 companies manufacturing pinball games. During the early 1930s, plain balls changed from marbles, which were prone to chipping, to the steel ball bearings that we still use today. The first boom era of pinball was from around 1930 to 1934. During those years, most all of the games maintained the simple bagatelle format, a plunger or shooter handle, and a variety of holes surrounded by pins on a slanted board. While the majority of the new pinball games were coming out of Chicago in the early 1930s, an independent game designer named Harry Williams in Southern California was working on new ways of reintroducing electricity to pinball. For the very first time, Harry Williams came out with a game called Contact. Battery powered. It not only allowed the player to see how a ball was able to be kicked out of a hole using a plunger on a solenoid that kicked the ball out, Secondly, it had light, it had a lighting effect on the game. And third, it did another thing, which is, was not done at that, up to that time. It had sound effect in the game, which gave a little ringing bell when you accomplished something. Pinball was suddenly a fast-moving action game, and Contact was a smash hit. Harry and his partner, Fred McClellan, could hardly keep up with the public's demand. Soon, all of the other manufacturers were utilizing the mighty electrical solenoids to propel the balls on the playing field. This spelled the end for the old gravity-controlled machines. When Williams introduced the bells to contact, he soon realized that players demanded sound. In fact, three times as many players were plunking their coins into the contact game as opposed to the silent games. Production in the pinball industry was at an all-time high. By 1934, thousands of new electronic machines were being produced by close to 100 different manufacturers. Williams, who would go on to become one of pinball's greatest designers, brought many important innovations to the game, including the pedestal tilt. He came up with a little pedestal that what you had a little ball, small ball, placed on the top of this pedestal. And as you put in your coin, the pedestal came up, and the ball was sitting there on top of this pedestal. One day, Harry walked into the location watching them playing, 
his game with that little pedestal and the ball on top. And he listened to them playing, and then all of a sudden he heard somebody yell, hey, he tilted the game. The ball fell off. And from that day down, he used the name Tilt. The pedestal tilt later evolved into the pendulum tilt, which is still in use today. Williams also invented the free game wheel, which would reward the player with a replay or a credit as opposed to a monetary payout, thus creating the industry term for amusement only. Harry Williams' expertise in the new and exciting world of pinball was making him renowned in his field. David Rocola, known by most people today because of his success in the jukebox industry, was intrigued by the popularity of pinball. Rocola wanted in. So, he recruited none other than the pinball maverick, Harry Williams, to be the chief designer at the new Rockola Pinball Division. When Williams joined hands with Rockola, their pinball business quickly flourished. This game we see here is the most well-known and most popular of the Rockola Pinball line. It was called Jigsaw. Thousands of these games were manufactured by Rockola. They pulled in big revenues, probably due to the fact that a map of San Francisco at around the time of 1935 would jigsaw into place as various scoring holes on the playing field were attained. In the mid-1930s, there were close to 50 different pinball manufacturing companies in America. The marketing of games was booming, and the competition was intense. But most of these companies would not survive. Another new innovation that came to pinball in the 1930s was the more prevalent utilization of the back glass as a way of showing score tallies and also to display colorful and artistic motifs which would reflect whatever was popular at the time the game was made. The first back glasses were small but soon would grow in size giving the back glass artists more space to create and giving the players more to look at. In 1937, Bally introduced a new game called Bumper. Up until Bumper, scoring was primarily achieved by balls falling into the various scoring holes on the playing field. Not so on Bumper. When the ball would make contact with these electrified springs, points were awarded instantly. And better yet, your ball was still in play. A significant achievement for pinball. Just before World War II, there must have been anywhere from 12, 15, 18 companies producing pin games. And what happened is every company that was in existence at that time had a quantity of materials available to make games. So when the World War II broke out, all manufacturers could use only the materials that were, that were at that time in their possession and could not buy any additional materials like silver, copper, bronze, and the th additional materials that were really required, or wire that was required for the games. Most pinball companies involved in the war effort received lucrative government contracts. These same companies continued to make games after the war. Williams was no exception. The first game that Harry Williams produced as a production game was in February of 1946 called Suspense. So, by 1946, the stage was set. The major players that would hold dominance for the next 30 years were in place. Williams Manufacturing, D. Gottlieb and Company, and Bally. Of the big three, only Gottlieb would stick almost solely to the making of pinball machines. Bally would expand into slots, horse racing machines, rifle arcade games, and bowling shuffle games. Williams expanded into other arcade games as well. The war was over, and the public demand for pinball was still on the rise. Then in 1947, something happened. Something that would change pinball forever. Aside from the humorous Humpty Dumpty character seen falling off the wall on this 1947 Gottlieb game, Humpty Dumpty, the player also saw something that he had never seen before. It was called the flipper. And pinball was never going to be the same. Gottlieb introduced Humpty Dumpty. It did something to the industry that no other new gimmick or invention or idea ever did as much of the industry as those flippers did. You might guess that the first flipper game would have a pair of flippers. But Humpty Dumpty had six. 
Gottlieb originally called them flipper bumpers. And even Gottlieb himself wasn't sure whether they would be accepted or not. The flipper was invented by Harry Mavs. It was not a whole lot different from the bats used on the popular baseball games, which began to sprout up in the 1930s. Nudging the machines, as was the common practice of pinball players before the flipper came onto the scene, was replaced by the art of ball control that this wonderful new device now offered. Before the flipper, the player could do nothing to fight the laws of gravity. Now, he could. There was a lot of experimentation during the early days of the flipper. While Humpty Dumpty had six, some had four, or even just one. In the beginning, flippers were placed in a completely opposite manner on the playing field than they are today. They were backwards. It would not be until the mid-1950s that the pinball industry would universally adopt flipper positioning in the way that we are accustomed to seeing it today. In order to be more conservative than anyone had been in the industry, instead of putting four flippers or six flippers on a game, I decided to put two flippers at the bottom of the game to be more effective in play. And that's where they have been ever since. Another aspect of pinball that has always gotten the players' palms sweatier and hearts beating faster is the lighting up of the special. Originally introduced to pinball in the late 1930s, the special when lit was, and is still today, a hard-won reward for the player's skill. In most cases, after a sequence of targets or other playing field scoring objectives have been met, the player has an opportunity to win a free game. Sometimes this opportunity is a very brief one, because in most cases, the special lights up on the last ball, which adds even more drama to the game. You can see it, hear it, and in most cases, you can feel the crack of the solenoid as it kicks in when the free game is achieved. I think it became part of the pinball lexicon that exists out there, such as tilt, where somebody probably heard somebody saying, oh, I'm, I'm about to get a free play, or I'm about to get a special. And special one lit is one of those colorful phrases that the minute you say it, you know what it means. It's pinball. I mean, the whole idea with pinball is sensory reward. It's very Pavlovian. So if you look at, you know, what's the quintessential reward? The quintessential reward is winning a free game. So there's a knock, and you hear that pop. You hear something that kind of reverberates through your entire body because that's how you feel. You have that sense of exhilaration. And all it is is a knocker. It's wired, and it pounds and that sound comes out and you're washed at what you just had. Two other very notable innovations that would bring much more speed to pinball came in the 1950s. These are kicking rubbers and these are pop bumpers, known to many as thumper bumpers. When the ball made contact with a bumper, it would now be propelled outward with a powerized thrust, allowing the ball to hit other targets on the playing field. The thumper bumper was introduced originally by David Gottlieb in 1950 as cyclonic bumpers, soon to be renamed as kicking bumpers. Coupled with a new flipper, these two welcome additions made pinball a much faster and more exciting game. During the 1950s, score tallying was beginning to change from projected light scoring to a new and soon to be permanent replacement, the scoring reel. Back class artists of the time were particularly pleased because the original columns of projected scores were now gone, giving them more space to work their creative genius. Speaking of scoring, as was often the case when an established score was attained, the player would win a free game. But what if a player failed to achieve the necessary scoring to win the credit, or further still, could not light up the special when lit? Well, up until the mid-1950s, the player had no chance to win at all. Which brings us to this. On a 1957 Gottlieb game called Royal Flush, the player was finally granted one more chance to win. What Gottlieb had established back in 57 was then, and is still today, one of the most exciting elements of pinball. In matching, if the last digit or last two digits in the final score match with the randomly selected back glass illuminated number, then the player wins a free game. Original matching looked and sounded something like this.
Today, matching is more popular than ever before due to the more elaborate and sophisticated ways that manufacturers display the match to the player. As you can see, some are pretty wild. Don't let moon. Gentlemen, it's been a privilege flying with you. Something else new and exciting began coming to pinball during the 1950s. The emergence of the animated back glass. In many jurisdictions across America back in the 50s, pinball was still being observed as a gambling device. In fact, almost all of the bally machines of the 50s were bingo pinball games, made strictly for wagering or straight cash disbursements from the games themselves. Unfortunately, companies like Gottlieb, who were making games for amusement only, were suffering due to the association. Consequently, many amusement games that were awarding free games of any sort were unfairly outlawed. Of course, gambling pinballs had been around for years. This extremely rare 1930s game is the first electrical payout machine ever made. The first two-player game, a Gottlieb, appropriately entitled Duet, came onto the market in the early 50s. Soon, four-player games began to appear in the 50s as well. Up until 1957, most pinball machines had wooden legs, ash, the same type of wood used for making baseball bats. The rails that held the playing glass over the field were also made of wood. By the early 1960s, primarily because of the establishments where most of the pinball machines were located, the legs, as well as the rails, were beginning to be made of steel. And steel rails and legs have remained a constant in the industry ever since. Around 1960, Attaball games began to appear on the market. On the Attaballs, instead of winning games, you would win extra balls, thus prolonging playing time. This is the Gottlieb game called Flipper, the very first machine to feature the Attaball concept. The Attaball games were generally well received by the public, and the anti-gambling establishment seemed to be pacified as well. Up until the early 1960s, the ball was introduced into the plunger chamber through the use of a manual ball elevator. In 1964, Bally introduced the electrical ball return, a solenoid-powered kicker which would propel the ball up the short incline into the plunger chamber. By the end of 1966, the old ball elevators were virtually extinct. Another interesting addition to the playing field in the 60s was this device. The popular drop target made its debut on a Williams game called Vagabond. Drop targets remained a consistent and widely enjoyed playing field feature on many games throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. In 1965, on a Gottlieb game called bank -a ball return lanes were first introduced. This extremely significant innovation was so very simple in concept that it's a wonder that it took so long to come to pinball. The return lanes used a thin steel rail to split the side out lanes. Now the player had a 50-50 chance of keeping the ball in play longer. And better still, if the ball was saved, it would roll right down to the flipper, exactly what the players had been waiting for. The spinner made its initial debut to pinball on the Gottlieb game Swing Along. The spinner, as seen here, will rotate in direct proportion to the force of the ball as it hits the face of the flag. Points are scored on every rotation. This has always been a favorite feature for pinball enthusiasts because there's nothing better than a powerful direct hit off of the flipper and into the spinner. This 1963 GG game brought about the first ever bonus points for the pinball player. Besides adding points to the player's scoring, another reason for introducing bonus points was to keep the player from tilting the game. 
Most pinball players will agree that there's a great sense of satisfaction watching earned bonus points tally up at the end of their play. In 1969, Gottlieb introduced the unique Very Target. This was the very first calibrated target manufactured. As we see here in this game, the harder the Very Target is pushed, the greater the scoring. Like the spinner, points are awarded on the power of impact coupled with ball accuracy. From their inception and throughout the 1960s, flippers were rather slow and lacked a real punch. For a long time period, flippers all basically looked the same. But this began to change on a 1968 game called Hayburners 2. On this game, flippers increased in size from two and a half inches to three inches. This extra half inch gave the flipper more power. As DC current began to be employed in manufacturing, response time of the flipper improved dramatically. By the early 70s, by simply switching the flipper coil from AC to DC, flippers gained tremendous power. During the 1960s, the whole world was getting hooked on pinball. All of the big three, Gottlieb, Williams, and Bally, were having huge success in the export markets. In 1969 alone, over 50% of Gottlieb's sales were outside of the United States. Looking at the world marketplace for pinball, uh, what's significant is World War II. It was the establishment of the USOs overseas. And for GIs who wanted a flavor and a piece of what they were fighting for, it was being able to go to these places and have a jukebox, have a pool table, have a pinball machine. Well, the war ended. The equipment didn't come back. It stayed there. And it filtered really into society, into England, into France, into Germany. You have an adult audience overseas. It has always been something where, because it's Americana, there's been a unique attachment to it. And I think what has happened over the years where Europe today dominates sales. Uh, overseas, internationally, uh, about 60 to 65 percent of our business is done overseas. Also in 1969, Pete Townsend of The Who had composed the rock opera Tommy about a deaf, dumb, and blind pinball player. Tommy was a pinball wizard and the 45 of the same name was an instant AM radio hit. But more importantly, players now had a name for themselves. The motion picture Tommy came out in 1975. The cast featured Elton John, Anne Margaret, and members of The Who. The Broadway production is still selling out today. As may be expected, pinball players are never happy to see the cost per play go up. From the 1930s up until around 1960, the cost to play went from a penny to a nickel. By 1960, coin mechanisms were modified to give one play for a dime and three plays for a quarter. Into the 70s, most games began to award two credits per quarter. As the late 70s approached, games began to change from five balls to three balls, one play for a quarter and three plays for 50 cents. Many operators were attributing their price increases due to the newer and more advanced solid-state machines of the late 70s. For a very short time, when the industry was under the illusion that the Susan B. Anthony dollar was to remain a monetary mainstay, machines accepted them as well. Today, it's one three-ball game for 50 cents and three three-ball games for a dollar. One of the most celebrated and eye-catching aspects of pinball has always been the backlash. It is what first lures the player to the machine. With its beautiful multicolored motif, it beckons the player to come closer and give the game a try. Some backlashes are amusing and interesting to look at, while others take us away on an adventure, either in the past, present, or future. Some are pure fantasy. They can remind us of fun and relaxing time spent with friends, they reflect our popular recreational pastimes or a bit of history. They may give us a glimpse of Hollywood or they may take us into the world of rock and roll. 
Pinball's target market has always been young men, primarily between the ages of 13 and 25. And that's why backglasses have always portrayed women as young, trim, and voluptuous beauties. Pinball art is really the, the epitome of, of what fantasy escapism is. It's comic book artwork, it's, it's uh, record album artwork, it's poster artwork, it's everything wrapped into one, and it has one dynamic quality that no other art medium has ever had. It's all backward. Or as somebody once said, good artwork gets the first quarter in, and a good playing game gets the rest of the quarters. During the mid-1970s, another major technological breakthrough had come to pinball. The advent of solid-state electronics as opposed to the long-standing electromechanically operated machines. Also, digital LED scoring was introduced as opposed to the old scoring reels. As machines moved towards solid states, the guts of the machine went from this to this. Operators and repairmen had to learn a whole new bag of tricks to be able to work on the new high-tech machines. This is Captain Fantastic. It was one of the last mass-produced electromechanical machines ever made. Any of today's serious pinball dealers or collectors, when referring to a machine, will either call it an electromechanical, a solid state, or an old wood rail. While the cost to play was increasing and machines were switching over from the old electromechanical to the newer solid state machines of the mid 70s, another player had entered the gaming arena. Video games, when they first came on the scene, I think that uh, within the industry, there probably wasn't a lot of thought given to them. Not a lot of consideration. But for a TV generation that had grown up, the idea of controlling something on a TV screen was incredibly compelling. Games like Space Invaders, Centipede, Galaga, Pac-Man, and Asteroids began to compete for the almighty quarter. And they were winning. As games like these came onto the scene, pinball would drop to the number two spot for months at a time. Pinball would fight back with more sophisticated games, using more ramps, multi-levels of play, talking machines like the Black Knight, the Black Knight will play you, the new Magnus Save, multi-ball games, bigger machines with larger playing fields and back glasses. And more exquisite back glass art design. of these heralded changes and nuances to pinball were going to put it back at the number one spot in popularity where it belonged. But it never happened. There were a few bright spots for pinball even during the video game explosion. 
Games like Pinbot, Comet, and High Speed elevated the technology of the early solid-state machines from mere gimmickry to viable and essential components for the new generation of pinball. What pinball learned from video was, let me give it to them all. Let me give them everything. It started with the artwork, but it was all the other things that embraced it allowed pinball to really start relaunching itself. By 1986, pinball was coming back in vogue in a big way. In 1987, Gary Stern, formerly with Stern Electronics and before that with Williams, got back into the pinball business with the backing of the Japanese video game makers Data East. Also around the same time, a new company, Premier Technologies, was ready to invest heavily into Gottlieb manufacturing. Early in 1989, Williams acquired the Bally Pinball Factory. From then on, Williams and Bally Pinball would be made by Williams Electronics as separate brand names. In 1994, it was estimated that over 75% of all the pinball machines were made by Williams Electronics. Pinball was coming back in full force. In 1994 alone, it was estimated that over 10 billion quarters were dropped into pinball machines in the United States. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, we continued to see an array of interesting animated features on back glasses, as well as spectacular artwork. Welcome to the theater of magic. Playing field gimmickry continued to impress players. More machines were coming out that would talk to you. This Gorgar game was one of the first talking machines. This 1990 Funhouse game brags an interesting fellow who teases, yells, and laughs at you. His name is Rudy. Despite Rudy's many verbal objections, the object is to manipulate the clock to put him to sleep and then shoot the ball into his mouth while he's snoring. In the Terminator game, there's no plunger at all. You simply pull the trigger and listen to Arnold tell you what to do. Fire at will. Great shot. Or what you didn't do. What was interesting about the, the video dot matrix display was the fact that it gave us an avenue to basically bring parts of the movie into the pinball game. Again, it's not a video game, so it's not a TV screen, but it had a screen, it had a display that gave us a lot of avenues to explore. Get out. Well, as you can see, we started with playing with the different things that are very unique to the whole Terminator universe. You'll be back for uh, a little po bumper post that'll come up to save you from being lost. The endoskeleton figure, of course, which was incorporated very clearly. This is the CPU chip that is actually inside the Terminator. And uh, in the special edition of the film, you get to see this little chip get pulled out. It's inside the brain pan in a hole right up here. The endoskeleton head was also designed into the game on the playing field where the ball would actually go into the endoskeleton's mouth and then be processed, if you will, into the cannon so that you could then use the, uh, use the cannon as the, one of the special features of the game. So all of the parts were really integrated so that it was authentic to the movie and exciting to play in and of itself. 
I'll be back. Welcome aboard, Apollo 13. Sega Pinball's Apollo 13, which was based on the popular motion picture, featured some truly incredible and never before seen playfield gadgetry. It also set a pinball record for the most multi-balls ever used on a game, 13. Sega Pinball's Jeff Bush was put in charge of all of the creative artwork on the Apollo 13 game. As Jeff explains, there was a slight problem with Tom Hanks. Well, once we discovered that Tom Hanks was not going to be available, we tried a number of different approaches. Uh, focusing on the ship, uh, we tried the approach that uh, the studio used on the movie poster which is just a small ship floating in space. We tried it, didn't work. But the big problem that we had to get around was the fact that we can use Tom Hanks. So we tried playing with something that I thought, this is what we'll do. We'll put him in the suit. Reflection on the mask. That's all you see. Whenever you see NASA photos, you don't see a face inside there. It's the reflection, lunar surface, whatever. So it's a terrific solution. It's Tom Hanks. But it's not Tom Hanks. Incidentally, this beautiful artwork seen here was the original choice for the Apollo 13 back glass. Unfortunately, it was not used. When it was time for Joe Kamenkow, formerly of Data East and later with Sega Pinball, to come up with a new and exciting game with a real rock and roll feel, he would call on the services of the Mad Hatter of rock and roll, Slash. So Slash walks in with his entourage, and he's wearing black leather boots, black leather pants, t-shirt, massive gobs of silver chains just hanging from his arms for, for when he'd play pinball, they'd be clanging. And the hair and the nose with the earring in it, and, and well, to be honest with you, we had never met a rock star before, but he was pretty nervous. He'd never met pinball guys. Well, for one, okay, there hasn't been a cool pinball machine in the last 11 years as far as rock and roll is concerned, right? I think the last one, not to plug Ted Nugent, but it was, was Weekend Warriors. Anyway, um, uh, so when we decided to do one, it had to be something really cool and different and, and exciting. And so the Guns N' Roses machine is the loudest one ever made, so there you have it. The funny thing about it is that the whole object of the game, if you know any history of Guns N' Roses, is to get the band on stage, right? So you go through all six members, which is this shot right here, all right? Every time you make this shot, you get another band member. If you get all six of them, the band is officially on stage, and all six balls come out, and then you get to play a six-ball game, all right? And that's got a certain personal humor for me, all right, because uh, we're notorious for not getting on stage on time. So initially, when we started designing this game on the napkin, <laughs> um, it was drawn out with a basic goal, which was the G and the R ramps, and that's where it started. And so here they are. To be able to establish the fact that it is what it is is really important, and it's nice to have a real a, official rock and roll machine that has our name on it. Yeah, so I'm happy. The most prevalent themes in pinball have always been pool, playing cards, horses, and of course, baseball. 
However, it would not be until 1992 that a pinball manufacturer would turn to a major league superstar to be featured on a game. The game was Premier Technologies' The Big Hurt, and the player was none other than punishing slugger and future Hall of Famer, Frank Thomas. What does it mean to have your own pinball game? Well, let me tell you right now, to have my own pinball machine, it's, there's a rush, it's a thrill, it's everything. It's like, this game is your game. You want to be the best, it's yours. When friends come over, they want to play this game, it's a challenge. And when you issue that challenge, you let them know when they leave the house, this is my pinball machine. You will not beat me. It's like, bases loaded, three and two, the pressure is on. I will survive in this game. I will be the best. And when you're talking similarities of pinball and baseball, there's not really a big difference. When you step up to the plate, you don't know what's coming. You hope that you get what you want, but it's not going to happen. you got to be ready. When I'm locked into this pinball machine, I know balls are going to jump left to right, up and down, fast, through the sides, up and down, through the downstairs, through the upstairs. But i got to be ready. i got to be focused in. I can't lose my focus. I can't lose my concentration. i got to be there. Because that fastball come down the middle, i got to be right there to hit out of the ballpark. If this ball come down the middle, i got to be able to shake the machine and knock it back up and hit a home run on this thing, too. Something else is similar in the game. When I'm up to the plate, I got that big bat in my hand. But when we're at this pinball machine, I got my flippers. But one thing about my flippers, I gotta be really, really focused in because you just can't swing the flipper. You gotta have finesse, you gotta have control, you gotta have touch with this game. And it's just like it's three and two bases loaded the top of the ninth. Hey, I gotta be locked in, channel in, and I gotta make something happen. And when I'm playing this game, I want it to happen. I got to make it happen. I guess my pinball story starts in, uh, I guess in the, uh, in the early 60s, because um, I used to go up to Lake Sunapee, uh, which is kind of a summery kind of place every summer, I, since I was about five, and, and there was this one place we used to hang out called the Anchorage, among other places. That's where all the kids used to go and hang out, and that's where I used to hang out, and uh, pinball to me was just this, it used to be a machine in the corner somewhere. And, we didn't, I don't remember going to any arcades or anything like that. You know, once in a while you'd see a bunch of them in one place, but mostly it was, um, it was just this, they would, they would change it every two or three years. Sometimes there'd be two pinball machines there, sometimes one. Though I really didn't see myself as being a greaser, those seemed to be the guys that were always playing there off in the corner. And uh, I, uh, I loved playing it, you know. It was just something that was, uh, it was, a, it was a meeting place. It was always like you'd walk in, you'd see who was playing pinball, and, and somebody would be there, so the girls would be playing, and you'd go and hang out. Sometimes, just before I walk on stage, if there's a pinball game back there, I, I play it, because it clears my mind out, and it gets me in a place that uh, it just centers me. And it sounds, uh, it's almost like a, a zen kind of a thing, that it brings you, to, it wipes away everything else that's going on, and it just, and you just concentrate on the ball. I was getting ready to go on stage in Toronto a couple of nights ago and they had a pinball game there and uh, you know I had to play it and I got behind it and uh, kept the ball going for a while until Jimmy our uh, road manager was yelling at me that we were late to go on stage because that's how far it took me away it's a it's a physical thing too you know that I, that I really like about it I just I just love pinball Sony Pictures' Sony Signature's Ron Rubin gives us an inside look at the licensing of a movie for a pinball game. The pinball games today usually have sound, they, have, they may have voice chips, they certainly in the back glass get very elaborate, they're, they're, they're pieces of art. And usually the reason why the pinball company is buying a license is so they can take the key art from the film and, and use it in their product development. So we had to make sure we had those rights and going through all the actors' agreements. Then we went out and talked to pinball companies, negotiated a deal with the objective to try to get the pinball machines out at the same time as the movie. In the making of a pinball game based on a motion picture, you have to deal with the stars of the film. It was Sony Signature's Kristen McKiernan's job to make sure that Robert De Niro was happy with his likeness as it appeared on the game Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. For Robert De Niro, for example, he had a large part of the back glass is his face in his character. Um, we went back and forth a lot of times with him. He was pretty, fairly easy on approvals. Um, he didn't want to get involved in the game specifically, like in doing voiceover, but he was very good about the photograph approvals. 
what we do when we submit artwork is send along a letter for the actor, in this case Robert De Niro, to sign indicating his approval of his likeness. This device I created for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein pinball, and this is Robert De Niro, he played the lead role. His head moves back and forth in gameplay, and if you were to shoot a shot that you weren't supposed to be shooting at that time, he'll shake his head no, so he's very animated. And also the balls deposit into the palms of his hands, and then the arms move so he can actually throw the balls during play back at the flippers. Sometimes, even popular TV shows get to become pinball games. One of the voices you hear on the Baywatch game is David Hasselhoff. The show's co-producer, Craig Cassizer, explains. The pinball engineers came out to record David's voiceover and um, were yelling stuff. David was yelling uh, lines they had written to go with the pinball game. And uh, he's yelling things like, save me, or hurry up, or multi-ball, multi-ball, or don't give up. affordable entertainment, something that you can just escape into, that has some nice little lights and some wonderful little bells and sounds that you can walk away feeling very satisfied because you've done something that you were never able to do before. You made a shot, you got a certain score. That's the innocence of pinball. It always has been, it always will be. Playing pinball is a unique experience. It is something that is totally interactive, totally immersive. Um, if you're in the zone, Nothing else matters. It is you and the game. I used to think that it was man versus the machine, and it's not. It's man with the machine. You have to get into sync. You have to get into the rhythm and the flow of the ball. You have to pick up its rotation, its spin, its speed. Uh, you're one with the game, and I think that that one with the game uh, goes down to the flippers being extensions of your fingers. If you could actually reach in under the glass and move the ball, that's how it would be. That's the purity of you being in sync with that game and playing. You feel everything. You're part of the music. You're part of the rhythm. You're part of the sounds. You're part of the lights. It's all of you. It's your heart beating and pulsating with the game. Where do I think pinball is heading? Well, wherever the cutting edge of technology is going to be, that's where pinball is going to be. Not a lot of people realize that in 1976, there weren't any home computers, but there were solid state pinball machines. I see a whole exciting world of pinball with fantastic games coming for years and years. A couple of years ago, I did this crazy game that controlled the flippers with your brain waves. You didn't even touch the game. You just sort of did like a kinetic telekinetic thing and the flippers moved and responded. Um, I don't think we're quite going there because it's that physical rush that makes pinball so alluring to everyone. Where's it going? Levitating balls, floating pinballs, 100 pinballs, purple pinballs. I don't know yet, but we'll find out. Where do I think the future of pinball is going? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think that it can be anywhere that the imagination takes you. Um, there are great mechanical devices that exist now. There's multi-ball play, there's ramps, there's things that five, ten years ago didn't exist that no one thought was ever going to be possible. Uh, I think that what the future holds is whatever the imagination believes is possible that these guys can help create. Uh, Multi-level play fields, laser lights, us being part of the game more interactively, uh, absolutely. 